Vladimir Putin has just concluded a visit to North Korea where he met with Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of the North Korean regime, and signed what is by all accounts the most pervasive uh, and, and alarming in some regards uh, military pact uh, the, since since the Cold War ended, since sometime during the Cold War, the, the folks, this is a lot more significant than than many people are, are uh, in the West have really understood. I, I think that some people are of the opinion that this was uh, just another visit from Vladimir Putin, just trying to uh, bolster support. No, no, there's there's a lot of significance to this. Maybe, well, not maybe, more so than I think most in the West are aware of, and it's something that the America, especially better wake up to and recognize what's going on and how much incredible damage we're doing to our interests, medium and long term, not just in the near term, but medium and long term. A lot of this damage is, is already in place and it's going to take many, many years to undo. What we need to make double sure we do is don't dig this hole any deeper. And as I'm about to show you, some of our actions right now, all of our actions, both at the uh, pundit level and at the government level, so far shows we're just grabbing a bigger shovel. First of all, let's take a look at what actually happened here. Now, of course, as some of these pictures you're seeing right now, uh, a lot of imagery of the, of the two leaders actually getting together and, uh, you know, and, and having lots of, of good photo ops and things that make them both look good and uh, powerful. Uh, and especially to the global South and definitely to their populations, these things are having huge ramifications and huge positive impact. And even though it's ridiculed in the West, that doesn't make any difference because the West isn't really the target audience on this one. It's domestic audiences and it's the global South and other parts of Asia where they're trying to further peel away credibility of the United States. And so far, they're having a lot of success. Here is what Kim Jong-un said about what he's bringing to the table in this partnership. The government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea appreciates the role and mission the powerful Russian Federation serves in maintaining the world's strategic stability and balance. And we express our full support for the Russian government's special military operation in Ukraine to protect its sovereignty, interests, and the stability of its territory. That was a that was a big deal when he expressly uh, said we support our Russian allies in their special military operation. Used the same language that Putin does, and specifically said that we uh, support you in your war against Ukraine. So there's no ambiguity. So they are overtly doing this, and of course, as as the you've probably seen on many uh, news uh, cast around the. The, the United States these days, both online and, and news reports, uh, that up to 11,000 containers, which, which are estimated to contain somewhere around 3 million artillery shells, along with rockets uh, and other kinds of military gear uh, that they've sent to, to Russia to use. And it's been a huge impact on the ground because North Korea by itself is dwarfing by more than double everything the cumulative West has produced in artillery shells. Just that one category alone. By if if that's the only thing you carry away from this, let that get your eyes open and start going. Whoa, hang on. So the best the U.S., the Western Europe, uh, and all the places they can scrounge is estimated to be about 1.5 million shells when all of 2024 is is counted together. Ukraine has uh, Russia has probably gotten three million from North Korea by itself. And by all accounts, that number is just going to continue to rise because they have uh, lots of manufacturing going on within North Korea from the reports that I've been able to read. And that's on top of everything that Russia is doing, because it is it is also expected to produce somewhere between three and four million shells this year. And that number is also supposed to go up in the future. So no matter what is going on in just those, that one category alone, just this one uh, pact alone, Russia is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger relative to Ukraine. Now, I, I, I say this all the time, and I don't ever want to miss an opportunity here. It's manpower. It's not money. It's not machines. It's not even ammunition. It's manpower is the, is the central irreducible point of, of a warfare. 
and Ukraine doesn't have the numbers. They're never going to have the numbers. And every year that goes past, every month that goes past, that balance goes the other direction. But when you add the manpower advantage that the Russian side has with this overwhelming and growing capacity uh, for the weapons and the ammunition, folks, you just see it's irrational to think, okay, this is going to work out good for the Ukraine side because we want it to. So that's the first big point here. Definitely not the only point here. This is also a mutual thing here. And and here's what uh, Vladimir, so, so I just showed you what Kim Jong-un said he's bringing to the table. Here's what Putin said he's bringing to Kim Jong-un's table. This confrontational policy pursued by the United States to expand its military infrastructure in the region goes hand in hand in the growing scale of military exercises involving South Korea, Japan, and they're clearly hostile with regard to the DPRK. Such steps undermine peace and stability on the peninsula and threaten the security of all the countries in Southeast Asia. So he basically just repeated all of Kim Jong-un's statements that they've been making for many, many years that, you know, all these joint exercises, especially between the United States and South Korea or the United States and many of our other allies in the region, like Australia, uh, Japan, uh, several others. Uh, and, and we have in bilateral negotiations. He's been always saying, you know, those are prelude to war and, and it's, you know, it puts our security at risk. Well, now Putin's added the credibility of Russia on top of that. So he's saying the same things as well. It went a little bit further later on his speech because he, then he, he goes back into the situation in Ukraine and what the United States and the Western Europe is doing in terms of allowing weapons, our weapons, to be used on Russian territory. Putin added this. Большой, большого радиуса действия самолетов F-16 и э, другого высокотехнологичного вооружения, техники для нанесения ударов по российской территории. В этой связи Российская Федерация не исключает для себя развитие военно-технического сотрудничества с Корейской Народно-Демократической Республикой в соответствии с подписанным сегодня документом. Okay, that, that phrase he used was very important because he said military technical capabilities. That is the exact same phrase they used in, a, in about the last two or three months before they attacked Ukraine. They said that if, if Ukraine continues to go down the path of trying to join NATO and NATO keeps giving them the opportunity, then he said we will use military technical terms to prevent that from happening. So he just used the same language that he used before you taken military action before, and he directly tied this to what the U.S. and the Western allies are doing against Russian uh, territory in the re Ukraine war by saying he may be willing to give things like this to the North Korean side. Now, imagine what that's going to be. North Korea obviously has uh, significant capacities in artillery shells. Now, they've given three million, allegedly, to the, to the Russian side. Well, I assure you, they probably have somewhere around three to four to five times more of that on their own already, because they're certainly not going to diminish their war fighting capacity. They have massive use of artillery. They, that's, they have, uh, and from the time that I was stationed on the South Korean peninsula, uh, during when, during when I was on active duty as a captain, spent a lot of time up in the DMZ area, uh, and studying the North Korean fight with, you know, a lot of focus and they prioritize artillery, uh, more than any other weapon system, even more than tanks and, and infantry fighting vehicles, et cetera. Uh, rockets are always important, but but the artillery was something they really prioritized. So there's, they no doubt have millions upon millions of artillery shells and the ability to produce more. Where they had some uh, weakness, however, was in their long-range ballistic missiles, especially their ICBMs. Now, it was important to understand, especially from the United States, that they developed uh, and demonstrated the ability to have, I think it was the Hwasong-16 uh, long-range missiles that could reach anywhere in the United States a year or so ago. And, and so now we, we believe that they have the cap capacity to mount a nuclear warhead on there to strike the United States, but it's still a relatively small number. And some of their recent satellite tests, uh, which was also used to some of the same rocket motors have failed. So it's not entirely reliable on those things that could actually threaten the U S 
if you bring in Russian scientific capability, and Russia has obviously mastered uh, a lot of these uh, uh, the uh, the vehicles, whether it's glide vehicles, whether it's you know some of the glide bombs, which Ukraine didn't have. Uh, I'm sorry, with North Korea doesn't have yet, uh, or some of these other capabilities. Uh, Russia now is making clear that they're willing to share that technology with North Korea. And of course, that's making South Korea pretty nervous too, because now then the threat to them and the balance of power between North and South Korea could be shifting in the direction of North Korea. And South Korea has a significant technological and military capacity conventional advantage over North Korea. And of course, they have, uh, you know, some 28,000 American soldiers all there basically as a tripwire uh, to add into that should there ever be a war. That's always going to have been kind of an oscillation. If anything ever happens, most of the advantages go to Ukraine or to the, uh, sorry, I keep doing that, to South Korea, which is one of the reasons deterrence has continued to hold. If that balance starts to uh, get turned upside down, and if some of the advantages start going to North Korea, that's going to make South Korea very nervous. They may try to try to take additional actions here to try to increase their military capacity as well. There may be threats that uh, many are worried about. Uh, the, the United States maybe needing to bring more troops over there instead of just twenty eight thousand. Maybe they need to bring some of the armored units back on there. Lots of talk about uh, ramping this up and anything that just makes that things keep going up and up and up, and, and, and especially if. Kim Jong-un starts to feel like a, a nuclear superpower has his back, he might be willing to take more aggressive actions. And anything that increases the chance of war would be catastrophic for the South Korean people. It would be catastrophic for the region and something that wouldn't be good for anyone. But it's an increasing possibility. All of this goes back to our support for this war between Russia and and Ukraine. And now you see it start to have impacts across the board. And this isn't just the, this isn't the only thing that's happening here of late. And, it, and it's, despite all of this, or rather in response to all of this, what has been the American response here? Well, there's a, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which I want to show you a bit of here, uh, because I think it's something that's really important. And you're going to see that it's met uh, more than with just what happened uh in, in Russia and Point Yang. This, this was from, uh, I believe it is yesterday, the Wall Street Journal, what the Putin Point Yang axis means. Now, I've just got through sharing here that it, it means that the, the risk of war is spreading and it, around the world it's getting higher and the risk to the United States is increasing. And a rational thing to do would be, okay, let's cool the jets here. Let's start using diplomacy and back off on some of these things that the other side is reacting to that are that's increasing our risk. That's what a wise person would do. But here's what the, the core of, of what the Wall Street uh, editorial board is suggesting. It's probably too small on your screen uh, for you to see. I'll read it for you. It says, but the first necessity is to shed the illusion that this axis is going away. Beijing, Moscow, Tehran, Pyongyang, Havana, Caracas, and others share a common interest in creating mayhem that stretches U.S. and Western defenses. Another illusion to drop is that these nations will give up their malign ambitions if the U.S. accommodates them and retreats to the Americas. This is the fantasy of some in the Trump wing of the GOP. The emergence of this hostile axis is a direct response to the perception of U.S. weakness and retreat. More weakness will court more aggression. The U.S. and its allies will have to rearm far more urgently than President Biden and Mr. Trump seem willing to do. The West will also have to stop thinking that global institutions like the U.N. are serving U.S. interests. The U.N. is now useful to mainly to Russia and China as veto blocking against the U.S. and to Iran and Hamas as a forum for hostility to Israel. So that, that is just absurd because they are completely absolving off us of any responsibility to this. Instead of even having the slightest willingness to acknowledge that all of these actions that they just talked about, that whole list of countries, is because of what we have done in the Ukraine-Russia war. None of them existed before that. Let's be blatantly, frankly clear on this. None of those things were the case before this. 
All of those nations were basically stove popped out there. Russia and China had some uh, limited cooperation, but it had been limited for quite some while. They they kind of wanted to keep each other at arm's length because they have some historical issue and they're not completely sure they wanted to get tied with the other until until we launch into these actions here. And now then we have you know, we should have learned our lesson in, in 2023 that everything that we had tried wasn't going to work, that the Ukraine side was never going to win the war, and we should have sought a negotiated settlement then. The, the, there was numerous off-ramps that were available that Russia wanted because they've been willing to negotiate from the beginning, and we keep throwing it in their face. Well, now then, here we have uh, Vladimir Putin going and signing a military defense pact, an actual mutual defense pact with these two countries that's now actually is a, a, a treaty of sorts to where something that if one happens to the other, the, or if, if one is attacked, the other will respond in some way. So that's, that's one of the big ones right now, which has direct ramifications for what's going on in the Russia Ukraine war here. And again, that's what I just read you wall street journal. That's, that's not an official government policy. That's just the opinion of wall street journal, which, you know, it carries a lot of weight, but it's still not government policy. But let's see what our government leaders are saying and see if there's any more chance for any rational thought to finally come from them. Let's look first uh, at uh, State Department spokesman Matthew Miller. Anyone who cares about maintaining peace and stability on the Korean pen Peninsula, if you look at the what was contained in the agreements that they made public, it would include Russia violating UN Security Council resolutions that it voted for. So it continues to be a problem and we're going to work on it with our allies and partners, including those in the region. What does that even mean? We're going to work on it with our allies in, in the region. This is all a predictable, easily predictable, if you're paying any attention at all, degradation of situation here. It is now getting to now much more serious than it's been. At any time since this war started in February 2022, the conditions are now geopolitically worse for the U.S. than they have been. And this is a major milestone. We can't miss this and we can't ignore it. But he wants to. Miller's in the locked in the status quo mentality that we just ignore anything we don't like. We just ignore something that, that it's, it's going to go away. It's like, folks, it's like standing in the middle of, of the Highway 495, the Beltway in Washington, if you're familiar with that, and closing your eyes and saying, nope, there's no cars here, and so I'm going to be cool, and I'm just going to talk about it. it. It doesn't matter what you think. You're on a damn highway, and there are rogue cars out there, and you could get hit by them and have suffer harm if you don't do something quick, like get the hell out of the highway, get off the street is what we should be doing. But Miller can't seem to learn. So that it was bad enough that he's just trying to say, oh, well, you, you guys are doing something we don't like. And the UN says you can't. So we're going to talk to, you know, to more of our allies about it. They're also taking actions. Check this out. Ukraine's future is in NATO. It will become a member of NATO. We have made that clear. And we will continue to work with our allies in NATO about the exact bridge to membership and what that looks like and what uh, Ukraine has to do. So the cause of the war, the thing that started this war in the beginning was NATO expansion. That, that, that's been categorized. And we've, we've talked about that at length here. It's not just this channel. It's, it's all over the place. Russia has said it from the beginning. Everyone recognizes that it was NATO. Well, not everyone. Let me clarify that. There's some people that remain blind to it, like the guy standing in the middle of 495 with his eyes closed. Some people don't acknowledge it. All the facts are that it had everything to do with it. As I was writing about in the year, in the months, many months before this war broke out, that this goes back 15 years prior to the start of this war that Russia has been saying, don't put NATO in Ukraine or it's going to mean war. We know also because of what some diplomats have told me recently uh, that that was also communicated to President Biden prior to the war, that it did specifically mean war. If we didn't pull that back, we chose not to because, hey, we're going we're gonna to do whatever we want. I don't care what you're going to do. And, and we're bigger than you, or so we thought. And so now we have where we are here. So are we going to say that the thing that caused this war was uh, us forcing NATO entry onto uh, Ukraine, even though Russia had point blank said that it would mean war. We didn't listen then. Now then, here again, after all of this, after nearly two and a half years of war, we're reiterating, and this is all, of course, heading into next month, where there's going to be the 75th anniversary of the NATO founding here in Washington, D.C., and 
we still say NATO's on the table. We're still saying the thing that caused you to go to war, we're still pushing it. And so what is Vladimir Putin doing to do? So he's he's in, in just signed this defense pact with North Korea. He also said at that occasion, he was talking about, you guys keep talking about long range missiles and F-16s. Let me tell you something about this. The bottom line is this. Um, the Ukraine strategy that we've had and that we've been acting on uh, individually and collectively now for um, nearly two and a half years uh, is showing effective results. Effective results in making sure that Ukraine can ward off Russian aggression. And it's done that remarkably. Keep in mind, Putin's objective from day one was to erase Ukraine from the map, to end its existence as an independent country, to subsume it into Russia. That has failed. Okay, that, that is a lie. That is a point blank knowing lie. Secretary Blinken knows for sure that was never the Russian objectives. Russia has said as much from the beginning. They continue to talk about it this day. They showed a force structure that that uh, that proves that they don't have any desire to take all of Ukraine, much less anything in NATO. So he knows that's a complete lie. So to say that our our strategy has been remarkably effective is is just I, I just hardly have words for it. It is amazing and shocking that you have the Secretary of State and, and the, the, the spokesman in the State Department as well keep making these kinds of abs absurd claims. Of course, that was never Russia's intention. What is Russia's intentions is to get the Donbass, is to keep Crimea. That is their absolutely. Putin, again, directly stated this about a week or so ago where he said he's seeking a negotiated settlement that are in very draconian terms that are not preferable to the West or to Ukraine. And they specifically said all the four regions that he has illegally annexed are going to be part of Ukraine or part of Russia to include the Crimea. So it is those territories. It's not the all of Ukraine that he's looking for. It's not anything beyond Ukraine. It's just this. Ergo, our strategy has been a complete and utter catastrophe. It's been a complete and total failure. And yet there he is trying to stand there and tell you that that's what uh, that that's that they've been a failure. And that our side has been successful. How can you possibly say that our strategy has been a success when you now have Russia and, and uh, North Korea with a defense pact? You have uh, Russia and China. Uh, continue to improve relations as, as Putin just visited with Xi Jinping just uh, a, a couple of weeks back that uh, that Russia and, and Iran have have continued to increase their military cooperation, direct ammunition, weapons, systems, artillery. I don't know about artillery shields, drones uh, and some missile capacity, other technological capacity from Iran going to to Russia to help them in their war. Russia today was in Vietnam. Uh, where, where Putin signed another agreement down there with Vietnam. He's continuing to move across there. Or, or that the uh, the Russian economy continues to get stronger. We thought we were going to destroy it. That's what Biden said so many times in the first uh, weeks of this war, in the first couple of months, that he was going to destroy the Russian economy and just collapse it with the most crippling sanctions known to man, is what he claimed at the time. And how's that worked out? Russia's economy is growing. Germany's economy is probably in a recession, but definitely anemic across Europe at most. Energy prices continue to go up. They're causing huge trouble with the economy across the board in Ukraine. All of those things, you want to tell me that's a success? Folks, this is fundamental. This is practical. This is measurable. You can count these things. They are profoundly against our interest. And yet, we have the American government continuing to say the opposite. Truly, it's like standing in the middle of a highway, closing your eyes and saying, no, everything's cool. I'm fine here. You just haven't been hit with a car yet. Those cars don't want to hit you, but if you stand out there long enough, one of them's probably, probably going to get you. And that's that seems to be our strategy here. And, and then you look at things in, in, uh, on a little bit more granular level. So I've already talked about the 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 air power 
Uh, I, I've talked in recent days about some of the uh, electronic warfare capa capabilities that the, the Russians have, the manpower, I just mentioned a minute ago, artillery shells. Uh, and now there's also this glide bomb issue here. Here's a, a, an updated re report on some of the glide bombs and why this is a big problem tactically on the ground for Ukraine. We've heard a lot about Russia's wonder weapons, its modern weapons like the hypersonic Kinjal missile. But the beauty of these glide bombs, as far as Russia is concerned, is that they have a lot of them. They can quickly make it into an effective weapon that they can use. And we're at a stage of the war where the economics matter. Well, they give off a very small signature. They're relatively small in size. They only show up as small dots on a radar. And so the Ukrainians don't necessarily see them coming. So you have these these glide bombs, which are precision munitions, uh, and the West hadn't figured out how to how to block them. Uh, these uh, they haven't figured out how to use electronic warfare means. They they are too small or nearly too small to even be seen, much less shot down. So they are continuing to wreak havoc all across the front for the Russians against the Ukrainian side. That's on top of all of the manpower advantage that the Russians have and the artillery advantages that the Russians have. And, and as we've seen, this, there was another big barrage just last night uh, where some of the Kinzhal and, and uh, several other categories of long-range missiles that the Russians have, again, pummeled new, numerous sites throughout Ukraine. So they can never get ahead of anything. And, and you keep hearing these claims that the, the, the Ukraine side is going to set up uh, uh, manufacturing production on the ground in Ukraine. Well, folks, you know what they're not telling you is even at the best case scenario, it will take a couple years to actually have them producing anything. And that assumes that they won't be blown up as they're being built. A lot of the attacks that happened overnight were hitting some of the airfields where the F-16s are I guess, uh, reported to be uh, needing to be operated from when they eventually show up, which could literally be any time now. Some, sometime in the next month or two, uh, maybe by August, probably at the latest and, of course, people are going to be thinking that that's going to make a difference. And there'll be a lot of PR to that effect. It's not going to make any difference, folks. It's not going to. I can just tell you categorically, it won't make any difference in the outcome of the war. It will give them some more capacity on the, on the Ukraine side, but it won't change the, the balance of anything. It'll just be a few more shots that they can get into Russia. And as Vladimir Putin talked about in that clip I showed earlier, he may use that to actually spawn some other activity against the West somewhere else. And so far, other than this statement that he made about the technical military capacities that he would use to help North Korea, we don't know what else he's, he may have in his pocket. We, we think that he won't do anything because of the consequences, but you're, that's, again, just wishful thinking, using hope as a strategy. I hope he doesn't, and so we're going to keep going on blindly, walking down that uh, main highway, hoping that we don't get hit, hoping that Vladimir Putin doesn't say, hmm, I'm going to give some of these missiles to the Houthis in Yemen. I'm going to give some of these to some of these uh, 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 violent extremist groups in Iraq or in Syria where they can hit American forces there or in Africa where American forces uh, are down there where there's lots of Russian forces as well or any number of other places where they could give weapons to our enemies. In a worst case scenario, I think probably before, uh, this is just my estimation, before Russia would ever th even think about using nuclear weapons, I think that they would put conventional weapons in the hands of some Mexican cartels potentially for use in America. That, that, that sounds absurd to think, but why would it be? Why would, why would Putin not do that when that is precisely what we're doing to him? We're giving the country on his border weapons that are being used on his territory. He has said many times, why would I not, why would I withhold myself when that's what you're doing? He hasn't done it so far. Uh, of course, it would make people's heads blow up in the United States and people would be screaming to go to war with Russia. But we're, it, it's amazing that while we would show no con restraint and immediately respond, we think that Russia, because he has shown restraint so far, always will. And that is, again, that's just rolling the dice playing Russian roulette, forgive the pun, hoping that he doesn't ever do it. You see that everywhere this goes, the longer this war has gone on, folks, hear me, hear me. The longer the war has gone on, 
the greater the risk for the United States and the West increases. The worse things get on the battlefield for the Ukrainian side. The more Ukrainian people die. Now then, the risk of, of us being attacked around other parts of the world are growing higher. Our enemies are growing closer and more capable. More and more people, like the Wall Street Journal there, are advocating for a more muscular response. He wants They want a military buildup. Lots in Congress love that too. Backed by a lot of the people who vote for or who, who give campaigns uh, finance contributions to them from the defense industry, of course, back that up. But you see, well, this is continuing to go in a worse and worse direction. Everywhere you want to see, there is a strengthening of our adversaries and a weakening of our side and a degradation of our ally, Ukraine. Can, and that's the worst of it. If you can just imagine, say, say in December 2021, Ukraine was whole. It, it had the, the line of contact and the separation between the East and the West, uh, where the Donetsk people and Luhansk had, had uh, rebelled in 2014. And there was some skirmishes that were going along that line. But for the most part, uh, it was relatively contained and, and had, hadn't really changed much in, in the previous eight years. We had a chance to have a negotiated settlement. All we had to do, the fundamental thing we had to do, was say that Ukraine was going to be neutral that they were going to not join NATO. And at that time, they they were even, the Russian side was even saying, we're willing to say, hey, you can, Kiev, you can still have nominal control over everything except Crimea. They they That was never on the table. But all of the Donbass was, if they had some sort of uh, independent uh, ability to have uh, some autonomy in Luhansk and Donetsk even, they Ukraine couldn't even had an, an autonomous or, or nominal control over the Donbass. None of the cities would have been destroyed. None of the people would have been killed. And instead, what do we have? We have now a country that about a 20% of it is just turned into a moonscape. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian men are dead or, or, or catastrophically wounded. More are falling to the path. You, you've seen the many of you have seen the videos where Ukraine is uh, literally grabbing people off the streets in increasingly large numbers as th their terrified citizens don't want to fight. It's having a, a catastrophic impact on their economy because they have lost all these men who are no longer in the workforce and they're taking more and more off the workforce who are who are trying to do the job now, which has continuing to make worse their situation to even have any kind of manufacturing or anything else for that matter, because of all these Russian strikes all throughout the country, their ability to generate electricity is badly damaged. I, I think it's, it's like 30, 40% of, of its normal capacity. That's going to continue to get worse. The closer we get to, to winter when they won't even be able to have heat. They won't even be able to turn on, on any kind of electricity to manufacture anything, to keep their homes warm, to cook their food. I mean, there's already warnings in the country right now. Start looking for ways to move into the countryside, away from the cities, because we don't have the capacity to take care of you or heat you. And at least out there, you can get wood for fires if you go to some of the villages. Well, that 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 is just gutting the country. And instead of saying, oh, my God. The, the country is so much worse now than it was before they listened to us and said, yeah, I'll keep fighting. Maybe we should finally bring this to an end and get the best deal that we can in the war, in the suffering for the people, in the death and destruction, physically being meted out against the Ukrainian people, in all of the motivation that we're given to China, to, to uh, North Korea, to Iran, uh, to, to others uh, and in other parts of the world to m work more with Russia, to respect Russia and China more than the United States, because they see that we keep saying absurd things like I've shown you on this video here, things that are so detached from reality that people who aren't living in the United States or aren't living in Western Europe see it for what it is. And it continues to just chop the credibility of our, of our nation at the knees. We're chopping our own knees off. It's, it's just unbelievable and so catastrophic for the Ukrainian side. And I pray to God, and I mean that sincerely, and I genuinely do this every day, that we can somehow be wakened from our slumber, that we don't have to keep going down this until something really catastrophically bad happens somewhere. And, and folks, we're just living in a fantasy world if we think that nothing will ever happen outside of Ukraine, that it'll only be Ukraine that pays the price 
for our uh, foolishness long term. Our, our conditions are getting worse around the world as we speak. But so far, it hasn't had any concrete cost, cost to us. We're just rolling the dice and hoping that day never comes. And I fear that at some point it may. And I can't predict where it'll happen or what form it may take. But the, the clouds of war are forming around the world. More and more people are talking about that's, that's rearm, you know, it, kind of like what happened prior to World War II. Lots of people were talking about rearming. Lots of people were, which just gave fear to the other side. More impetus. You see where this goes. It's human nature. It's happened many times throughout the centuries and millennia of, of, of human nature. When one side starts arming, the other side starts arming. They get fear. And now then no one's wanting to talk. They just want to get ready. And then you get that spark. You get a spark and then all hell breaks loose. We're heading down that path if we don't wise up very soon and change course on what we're doing for our own security and that of the planet. That's uh, that's your that's your deep dive for today, folks. I want to make sure you're aware we're unintimidated and uncompromised to make sure that you get the information that you need, the truth, no matter what it is. Now, listen, we, we ask you to like and subscribe. I do that a lot here and I'll tell you one of the reasons because that helps us expand our view. It helps more people get to the truth. Uh, I also ask you uh, to to join with us. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the uh, the next of the uh, uh, Deep Dive Army huddle. Uh, that's what we're calling everything, the Daniel Davis Deep Dive Army of all the people who join become uh, members of our organization. And, and that's going to give you exclusive benefits to things like you'll be able to physically ask me anything you want as an individual because we it's a, it's a more intimate setting. It's only for the members. Uh, we kick around ideas for guests and show ideas. We want to hear what you think. We're we're already acting on some of the the uh, guest requests that we had last time. Some of the ideas for show. You guys have some great ideas. Love to hear them. Love to engage with you. And we can just kind of chat each other up and get to know each other about what's going down. But you can't do that if you don't join. So hit that join button. Uh, share this with your friends, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.